state and national action uh, director for the, um, the league. And is this mic right? Okay. Um, and I will be moderating tonight. We have several speakers, as you can see, um, from various groups. And we will be talking about those propositions and local measures that the League of Women Voters is supporting or opposing. Um, and I want to particularly thank Emily Allen for, for helping with this. also be one of our speakers. Um, speakers are Mary Rose, who will be talking about um, proposition, uh, pardon me, measures G and H um, on county redistricting. Emily will talk about, um, well, you know what, I, I think I'm gonna just introduce everybody at, at the beginning of their speech. But um, <laughs> I'm going to talk quickly about some of the local ballot measures. And we are, you'll see on the um, flyer on your seats that we are supporting two City of Santa Barbara measures and one for the City of Carpinteria, and I'll describe them very briefly um, and why we're supporting them. The city of Santa Barbara, as you may know, um, has switched from all the council members being elected at large to all of the council members being elected from districts, except that the mayor is elected. And you'll recall that when the mayor was elected as mayor, this left a seat vacant in her district. But the city charter said that it, it wasn't prepared for that, obviously. Um, you know, it just said the next person who, who, who got the the next highest number of votes would become, you know, would be considered elected to the um, council. But that couldn't happen because it has to be somebody from the same district. And so they had to have a special election. And the question was whether they were going to appoint somebody in the interim or not. And this was really quite problematic. So they have figured out a way to solve that uncertainty and the expense of having a special election at a special time. And so that is um, measure C. And that says, it, it changes the charter to say that the election will be called, it will take place at the same time as another regular election so that they won't have the expense and difficulty of having a whole special election at a special time. And it says that um, if the council needs to, because there will be a a gap in there, they can appoint somebody for the interim until that election is held. Um, and so that will both give all districts 
a, a representative during that time, particularly if the next election isn't supposed to be held for another year and a half, say. Um, and it will also uh, solve the problem of how to replace the mayor or how to replace a vacancy if someone um, moves out of town, you know, a council member moves out of town or for some other reason has to um, resign or passes away. So this will help to make sure that, that all areas of the city are represented by members of the council and um, it, it makes a lot of sense and so the league is supporting it. Um, measure B moves, oh and the other thing is that that, um, that charter amendment um, also puts in the charter the, the fact that, that the city council members are in districts. That's required by a court order. So if this measure is voted down, it won't be in the charter, but it will still be in effect. So, and that, that's uh, the, the method for uh, replacing someone who uh, leaves in the middle of their term would not be in effect if the measure was voted down, but the, the districts, change to districts, would still be. Um, so measure B is to change to even year, number of years, and again, this is a new state law which requires that, and so this would conform the city charter to this other new law. Carpinteria is having a local sales tax, um, and the league is supporting that because we support me measures that will give adequate funding for governments to operate. Um, and if you have any questions about those again, please put them on a card. Now we have two countywide measures, and Mary Rose is with the campaign to support those measures. They are on redistricting for the county. Every 10 years, the county is redistricted, and for that matter, so is the state. And currently, the county is redistricted by the, the Board of Supervisors themselves, just as, until recently, the state was redistricted essentially by the legislature. And the league worked very hard a few years ago to to make sure that the state instead was redistricted by a redistricting commission, which is independently chosen, very carefully, and is, is independent of the people who are currently um, in office in all of those districts. So, people apply, those who are best qualified um, are chosen to be in a, a final group, and people are actually pulled out of a hat from those qualified people in such a way that they, um, they are chosen to be diverse and experienced and and uh, in various uh, aspects of how to redistrict. And they have a lot of public hearings and do it in a very public way so that we 
really have a much better and more democratic, uh, small d, pardon me, um, way of uh, redistricting the state. Lee was very involved in that all the way through from um, trying to get that passed to um, making sure that the process worked well. So we are very involved in also in, in trying to figure out um, the county redistricting process. And I'm going to turn this over now to Mary Rose, who has working, been working on these and will explain them much better than I could. Oh, So, the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara and of the Santa Maria branch strongly have endorsed Yes on Measure G to establish the You Draw the Lines County of Santa Barbara Independent Redistricting Commission. As Linda pointed out, every 10 years following the federal census, voting districts are rebalanced and redrawn to reflect changes in demographics and maintain one person, one vote um, within the districts. So um, the League has long supported the establishment of truly independent redistricting commissions with membership that reflects the diversity of the area being drawn. And they played, a lead, as Linda pointed out, they played a leadership role in establishing the California Statewide Redistricting Commission, which is now being used as a model in many other states. This is, this is a trend around the country to establish these redistricting commissions and um, California um, the League feels strongly that every redistricting process should include full disclosure throughout the process and public hearings on the plan. In addition, the League states that redistricting at all levels of government must be accomplished in an open, unbiased manner with citizen participation and access to all levels and steps within the process. Measure G does just this. Measure G was developed by the Board of Supervisors in an open public process. There were public hearing that on the proposed ordinance, and many organizations, including the League of Women Voters and CAUSE, um, and many concerned residents offered suggestions to improve the draft ordinance, and changes were made. And so that we, and the, the ordinance was unanimously supported by the Board of Supervisors at a subsequent hearing. Measure G will create an 11-member independent commission modeled after the successful state redistricting commission, and it's also modeled after commissions that have been established in San Diego and Los Angeles counties. Um, the county commission will be comprised of two volunteers from each supervisorial district and one member at large, so we get to the 11. People with a financial or political conflicts of interest will be removed from the pool of volunteers, and um, that includes people who over the last eight years have run for county supervisor, worked for a county supervisor, or a political party, or donated um, significant dollars to uh, the county office, um, or controlled a donation, more than $500. And um, that list, that pool of applicants is to be screened by, by the Registrar of Voters for bias. The list would be available for 30 days so people could review it and comment. Um, the registrar then creates a pool consisting of 45 people, nine from each supervisorial district, um, so that they could, um, of individuals. Um, this has been, this is the way the other two redistricting commissions, they actually, LA has a much bigger pool. Um, we weren't sure we could get there with Santa Barbara um, volunteers. But um, they also both have a process for screening candidates for bias. Um, and they also look to candidates to rise to the top of the pool um, with analytical skills that are relevant to the redistricting process and voting rights and an ability to comprehend and apply the applicable state and federal legal requirements and a, some type of a demonstrated ability to be impartial and um, some experience hopefully that demonstrates an appreciation of the diverse demographics of the county. Um, it's a very open selection process. The first five members of the commission will be drawn at random. 
uh, much like the state commission was, um, one from each supervisorial district. Then there will be six additional members that will be selected, they'll be interviewed and selected by that first group of five. That'll be in a public hearing, and the goal is to have um, a, a final commission that reflects the diversity, racial, ethnic, geographic, age, and gender diversity, and to be as proportional as possible to the actual voter registration demographics of the county. Under this provision, minor parties are grouped with non-party preference um, so that those voices are also heard and eligible. Uh, and this type of making sure that it's balanced within the voter registration would prevent one party or another from dominating, um, which you could get with a random drawing, uh, which is then dependent on whoever's in the pool of, of to be drawn. Um, this fits and complies with the Leeds National Platform calling for the promotion of partisan fairness. The League also supports Measure G because it sets up an open and transparent public process for redrawing the, the district boundary lines. The measure calls for a minimum of seven public hearings with at least one in each of the existing five supervisorial districts before the maps are drawn. This allows people to come <coughs> and discuss the areas and the uh, communities of interest that are important to them. Um, after draft maps are drawn, then there will be at least seven additional public hearings to take testimony on those, to make changes, and um, before final maps are drawn. Um, these meetings will be largely broadcast live. They will all be taped. Hopefully they can be live streamed, but when we get out into some of the other um, uh, less densely populated parts of the county, which also need to have a voice, we may not be able to do a live broadcast, but they will all be taped and available for viewing. Um, and if there is also will be a public process where individuals can submit, uh, individuals or groups can submit maps to the commission for their review. And this is what was done by the Board of Supervisors 10 years ago when the board uh, last did its redistricting and the, the, the boundaries we have today were actually submitted by um, local residents to, uh, to the board. Um, the board did, did have the final authority to select that map and do it and this would put the power in the hands of that, this independent commission. Um, Measure G also very clearly calls out the, the, um, the rules for redistricting that they um, comply with the US Constitution, having reasonably equal populations. Um, the consideration is given to topography, geography, cohesiveness, uh, contiguity, integrity, compactness of territory, and to maintain communities of interest together. Districts must be geographically contiguous. You can't have part of part of Goleta and part of Carpinteria together. You have to be. It has to be contiguous. Um, the 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 rules call for, to the greatest extent you can, the to maintain the geographic integrity of any city, local neighborhood local community of interest shall be respected in a manner that reduces division. Um, given some of the demographics of the county, you can't always keep an entire city together um, in a supervisorial district. The city of Santa Maria is larger than one supervisorial district, for example. And we see that when you, you have to start at one end of the county or the other, so that's where the city of Santa Barbara is split into two supervisorial districts today. Um, but one of the main things that's really critical within redistricting is the concept of communities of interest. And um, different groups define that differently. The League is very clear on it. The community of interest is a contiguous population that shares common social economic interests that should be included within a single district for purposes of effective and fair representation. It shall not include relationship with political parties, incumbents, or political candidates. So you can't draw the lines to favor an incumbent or um, a candidate. The League of Women Voters platform calls for adoption of redistricting plans for more than a simple majority. And Measure G also requires seven of the 11 members um, must vote for any, for any map to be adopted. The League of Women Voters believes that Measure G will place the power to redraw supervisorial district boundaries 
away from politicians and place it in the hands of a well-qualified, independent, volunteer commission that reflects the diversity of our county. In addition to the League of Women Voters, Measure G has also been supported by the unanimous, unanimously by the Board of Supervisors, who have signed the ballot argument in favor of the measure. Um, it's been supported by both the Democratic and Republican parties. Uh, the Cause Action Fund, the Sierra Club, and the Fund for Santa Barbara have all endorsed a yes vote on Measure G. And um, you can always remember, Measure G is for good government. So yes on G. So, and uh, I guess I'm not doing questions now, so we'll go right into Measure H. And Measure H, which I like to say, if G is for good government, H is for horrible public policy. <laughs> uh, the local league feels very strongly about urging a no vote on Measure G and actually wrote the ballot argument in opposition. Measure H and wrote the ballot argument in opposition. Um, this measure deals again with redistricting and the league had many, many concerns. Largely that Measure H was drafted without any public input whatsoever. The proponents of the measure want you to think that this measure was designed by, quote, a diverse coalition of concerned residents from all parts of Santa Barbara County to prevent special interests from influencing the redistricting process. That's in their statement. But nothing could really be further from the truth. Measure H was designed by and funded by special interests for special interests. A new organization called Reason and Government with only three identified members and their campaign committee called We Draw the Lines spent over $146,000 to pay professional signature gatherers and qualify this initiative for the ballot. As of June 30th, when they last filed a campaign finance report, um, their donor list read like a who's who of the oil and North, count, North County development interests. They received $46,000 from the California Independent Petroleum Association Political Action Committee to fund this signature gathering. 95% of the contributions to this effort came from large North County landowners, oil and development interests, or the Sacramento Oil Lobby. This information is all publicly available on the county elections website. The League of Women Voters believes that any independent redistricting commission should be designed to produce a commission that is independent, not only of the Board of Supervisors, but political parties and campaign contributors and other special financial interests, and it should be reasonably representative of the county's diversity. Measure H provides no assurance that the commission it proposes will be independent or reflective of the community. Measure H establishes a complex selection process which enhances the power of the two major political parties at the expense of minor party members and the growing number of nonpartisan voters who decline to state a party preference. The only qualifications are that a person live in Santa Barbara County, be registered to vote, and state that they, their spouse, their ex-spouse, in-laws, or children have not been involved in or a donor to a political campaign for the past eight years. And it specifically also eliminates you if you have worked for the county or for a labor union representing county employees for the last eight years, um, which removes a lot of our active and very qualified recent retirees from service. Under this proposal, names would be drawn by, out of a hat, with the first person being a commissioner, and if the second name drawn lived in the same supervisorial district, they would become an alternate to the commission if and only if they were also registered with the same political party. Statistically, and this virtually assures through the, the process that the, the commission would be two Democrats, two Republicans, and an independent putting much more power into the hands of the political parties. Um, as I noted with Measure G, in 2016, the League of Women Voters adopted a position on redistricting which emphasizes that redistricting plans should require more than a simple majority. Measure H, Commission, would have only five members. They were chosen by, by lottery and no specific skills, and a quorum is only three members and only a simple majority is required to, to adopt new boundaries. That's bad public policy. The League of Women Voters policy states that redistricting at all levels of government must be accomplished in an open, 
unbiased manner with citizen participation and access at all levels and steps of the process. Measure H requires only one public meeting in each of the five existing supervisorial districts before the final hearing when the new districts are adopted. Our county deserves better than this. We deserve a truly independent citizens redistricting commission that operates with total transparency. Stop the in special interest power grab. Vote no on measure H for horrible and yes on measure G for good government. Thank you, Mary. And remember, if you have questions, just please write them on the cards. Um, we have somebody who could be collecting the cards right now. Hmm. We're, we're not having a break. Um, yes, would you please? Um, Now we'll begin with the state propositions. Um, as you can see on the uh, flyer on your seats, um, League is supporting or opposing seven out of the 11 propositions. Um, and we're only going to discuss the ones that we, ha we are um, either supporting or opposing today. We're going to start with propositions one and two, which are both bond measures that um, deal with housing. And to speak on those, we will have Emily Allen, who is with Home for Good, project of the North County um, United Way, and she's also the co-chair of our league's social policy committee. Emily. Good evening. So I'll um, hold up. Yep. So I'll start by talking about Proposition 1. This is the veterans um, and affordable housing bond. So I think that, you know, at the state, at the national, the state level, at the local level, the League of Women Voters is very aware about the affordable housing issues, the affordable housing crisis in California, certainly the affordable housing issues that we face here in the city of Santa Barbara and in our county also. So, you know, the state's extreme shortage of affordable housing has life and death consequences, especially for people um, who are very low income. And our own policies around affordable housing specifically address affordable housing for um, low and moderate income folks. So housing instability has been linked to public health crises, food insecurity, and development problems of children. Prop 1 will build and preserve affordable housing including supportive housing um, for people, um, for veterans, working families, and people with disabilities. So California, as we all, I think, also are aware, is experiencing a real homeless crisis. That's what I work on, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, especially as we get into Prop 2. And, you know, many people are struggling to find a safe place to call home. So this bond would authorize four billion in general obligation bonds to be used for, um, support, for supporting these affordable housing programs. It would also leverage federal dollars for construction of new housing. So um, I think that, you know, as Linda addressed before, adequate funding is something that the league looks at and this, this particular bond addresses a particular issue area that we focus on, so the league is supporting yes on prop, Proposition 1. So now Proposition 2, and as Linda mentioned, I work with the United Way on the Home for Good initiative, and I, I work all day um, on looking for solutions to our homeless crisis. 
um, particularly here in Santa Barbara County. So what, what we really recognize as the long-term solution to the homeless crisis is supportive housing. And we can look at our state numbers. A quarter of the nation's homeless reside in California. That's over 130,000 people. A significant percentage of people experiencing homelessness suffer from mental illness. So Proposition 2 would allow unspent money from the Mental Health Service Act, Prop 63, that the voters approved, oh, thank you, approved years ago to be, um, to be used to address this problem. So if passed, this unspent money from Prop 63 would be, would be used to provide permanent supportive housing for people who need mental health services and are either currently homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. So right now, you've been hearing a lot about California using funds for the what's called the um, Homeless Emergency Aid Funding. So that will allow us to invest funds into more short-term solutions, which is great. You know, over the next two years, Santa Barbara County will receive about $10 million to respond um, to homelessness with outreach, with rapid rehousing programs. But what's really needed to see a decrease in homelessness is supportive housing. And so um, this, this measure would create that funding stream for supportive housing. So I think that is good. The other measure that we are supporting is Proposition 10. So we're going to take that out of order because it is also a measure that involves methods to try to solve the housing crisis. Um, and I want to recognize um, Renee Christian Moya, who came up from LA tonight, and we appreciate your making that trip. He works for the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, and they are supporting the, a coalition supporting this measure. And we are not a member of that coalition, um, but we Welcome, Renee, and he's going to tell us why uh, everyone should support Prop 10. Hi, everyone. That's a little better. Uh, my name is Renee Moya. Again, I work for the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, or ACE. I'm also a member of the LA Tenants Union, a grassroots tenants' rights organization based out of LA. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Prop 10. Um, I'm actually pretty happy that we've been discussing the housing crisis here today, uh, but I do want to maybe add a little bit more context at what we're actually looking at in the state of California. I'd argue that we're not just looking at an affordability crisis, we're also looking at an eviction crisis. And that has to do with the fact that tenants don't have the protections that they need to be able to stay in their home, right? So again, we've mentioned the fact that about a quarter of the homeless population in the state of, uh, in the country, I should say, reside here in the state of California. One fact that a lot of people don't realize, however, is that the poverty rate in California, once we factor in the cost of, of housing, is the highest in the country as well. So there is, I would argue, a link between one thing and the other, right? Uh, what are some other facts that I'd like to share with you though? Um, again, there are about six million renter households. Over a quarter of those renter households in California spend upwards of 50% of their income on rent. Now mind you, that's households. The average household has 2.9 people, so there are millions of Californians 
who, whose income is uh, you know, sucked out by the ex exorbitant cost of rent that they need to pay, right? Now, most measures, of, uh, most measures that the housing authority, or actually HUD, uh, at the federal level uh, argue we should be paying a maximum level of about 30% of our income on housing costs. So a good proportion, over a quarter again, of households in California who rent are spending uh, their, about half of their income or more on uh, their rent, right? So it's fairly high. I'd also make, like to draw a very quick link though between homelessness and these rent increases. A study last year showed that every 5% increase in rent costs in the city of Los Angeles ended up throwing another 2,000 people out into the streets of Los Angeles to become homeless. And so when a lot of Angelinos, for example, ask themselves, why are there about 60,000 people out on the streets? Uh, you know, the response should be, it's because they used to have housing in this great city, or in Los Angeles at least, um, but they ended up losing their homes because of the exorbitant cost of uh, living. A couple of other things I'd like to mention. Uh, in Oakland, for example, something like 30% of the African American population of the city has been forced out in the last 10 years. I, a statistic that I actually saw fairly recently from Cause actually showed that something like 24%, if I'm not mistaken, of the Latino population of Santa Barbara uh, has left over the last 10 years, again, as a result of the high cost of living. Uh, we're seeing that across the board in all of our major cities, including, for sure, Los Angeles, where the African-American population of the city has dropped by about 150,000 people in the last 10 to 15 years. Why Prop 10, right? Proposition 10 just does one thing. It restores the ability of local communities, of cities and counties, to be able to implement uh, limits on rent increases depending on the conditions of their local housing market, right? It does this by repealing a statewide bill or statewide law that was enacted in 1995. It barely squeaked through the state legislature by one vote, uh, and it was signed into law by Governor Pete Wilson at the time. What did it do? Costa Hawkins basically uh, implemented three severe limitations on the form of rent control or rent stabilization that cities could implement. Number one, it said that single family homes if they are being rented out, cannot be brought under any rent stabilization ordinance. It said that any building that was built after 1995 could not be brought under rent stabilization. And in those cities that already had rent stabilization, it would be frozen in the year that that measure was passed. As an example, the rent stabilization ordinance in Los Angeles was passed in 1978. That means that in our city, we cannot actually move the date under which units can fall under rent control past that date. So no building, no, no multi-story or multi-unit apartment complex can be brought under rent control or rent stabilization regardless of what the city of Los Angeles wants because of this statewide law. There are similar restrictions on San Francisco and Oakland and all these other parts of the state. I should add that one of the reasons why that's a, such a problem, of course, is that what it does is it actually puts a you know, total cap, a ceiling, on the number of units that can be brought under rent stabilization. And because of another egregious law that exists at the statewide level, uh, another law that was passed in the 1980s, uh, those, that number actually, that stock of rental, uh, rent controlled uh, stock uh, of housing is actually dwindling every year uh, across the state. Finally, the third thing that Costa Hawkins did was to say that we could not implement vacancy control which existed in about five different jurisdictions across the state, including Santa Monica in LA County, um, and which was very effective at keeping rents uh, down. What is vacancy control? Vacancy control means that if I'm under a rent stabilized unit and I were to be pushed out of my home, whether through fair means or foul, and I can tell you as a tenant organizer that oftentimes it's via foul means or harassment by landlords, tenants, if they are pushed out, the incoming tenant can be charged whatever a landlord wants on that rent, despite the fact that no improvements have been made to the building, there have been no capital investments whatsoever. Uh, I've seen tenants who have moved uh, out of an apartment paying about $1,000 a month, and the incoming tenant being charged $3,000 a month, month for the exact same unit in Los Angeles. So these are the effects of this law, the Costa Hawkins Act, 
that was passed after a $50 million lobbying campaign by the landlord lobby. What does Prop 10 uh, do? Prop 10 basically just removes that. It gives us the authority, it gives local communities the ability to be able to respond to the crisis in ways that they see fit, fit in ways that also make sense to their local communities, right? It empowers those communities to be able to make those choices locally and not at the statewide level. We don't believe, those of us who are working on the Prop 10 campaign, that Sacramento should be making decisions for local communities to be able to determine the kind of rent control or rent stabilization uh, laws that they need. Uh, just a couple of things that I should probably add at this point. Again, I've made that link to homelessness, right? And the housing crisis and the rent uh, increases. These two things are inextricably linked. We believe that Prop 10, in being able to restore the right of these local communities to implement better rent stabilization laws, will also create stability for families. It creates stability for working class families, for families of color. Um, it prevents or helps arrest a lot of the gentrification process that you're seeing in our major cities and that is currently pushing out tenants across the board. I should say, of course, though, that this problem of displacement and rock skyrocketing rent increases isn't just affecting our major cities. We're seeing this across the board. In the state of California as a whole, uh, we're seeing a, again, grand eviction uh, crisis. Um, at the moment, something like 160,000 people are being evicted every single year in Los Angeles. The vast majority of those evictions take place as a result of rent increases that people cannot afford. And that is about a third of the number of folks who are being evicted statewide. This isn't just a, a problem in the city of Los Angeles. It's something that we're seeing increasingly affecting communities all across the state. And so again, this is one of the reasons why we're urging folks to vote for Prop 10. I'd like to very quickly though point out some of the support that we've uh, gathered so far. The ACLU has endorsed Prop 10 and in fact is putting in a lot of resources into campaigning for it at the moment. Uh, a number of our unions such as Ask Me and SEIU at the state level, the Democratic Party, uh, has f uh, formally endorsed Proposition 10 as of now, the California Federation of Labor, the California Nurses Association, the California Teachers Association, a number of housing uh, or affordable housing organizations actually just today got on a statewide call to discuss uh, their support for it. They understand that even though more building is necessary, more housing is necessary, we're not gonna be able to build our way out of the crisis, and any kind of building that we do is gonna come far too late for too many people who are gonna end up on the street otherwise. And this is one of the reasons why all of these different organizations, why the LA Times, why the Sacramento Bee have come out in support of uh, Proposition 10. I'm not sure how much time I have left, but okay, great. Um, I never know, I, I'm a big talker, so. I do wanna quickly mention though, some of the opposition to it. Some of the stuff that the opposition to Prop 10 is saying at the moment is that this is going to affect mom and pop landlords in particular. Um, I always like to respond with, look at the people who are funding the opposition to, the proposi to Proposition 10 and see for yourself or ask yourself if it's really the interests of mom and pop landlords that they have in mind. The top donors to the opposition for Proposition 10 are effectively corporate landlords. Companies like Blackstone, which is the largest landlord in the state of California, they own something like 15,000 units across the state. Um, its CEO of Blackstone, uh, Stephen Schwartzman, is worth something like $13 billion. Um, so the, the idea that he's somehow representative of mom and pop landlords in uh, the city of Santa Barbara or anywhere else is you know, completely news to me. Um, a number of huge developers uh, are also in opposition to Prop 10 because they know that they, this uh, proposition is a, you know, it will arrest the, the spiraling growth of their, of their bottom line, right, of the profits that they eck out of tenants across the state. I should also say that the rise of corporate landlords in California and not just in California is something that's, you know, deeply deleterious to people who are trying to buy homes for the first time, or even mom and pop landlords when they are trying to compete and buy more units on the market. Now why? Because corporate landlords understand that they, you know, it won't be covered under rent control in many of these jurisdictions where you're seeing an influx of capital into housing, 
uh, what can they do? They're able to outbid a lot of first time buyers on the market for single family homes because it's in their interests. They know if they can snap up a single family home in Los Angeles that they're gonna be able to charge you know, three or $4,000 worth of rent and they know that they can also afford to buy these homes cash in ways that the vast majority of first time buyers cannot. That is a completely different situation to what your traditional mom and pop landlord uh, it, you know, encounters when they are coming onto the market. We should also say that the corporate landlords who are opposing Prop 10 are also people who evict at far higher rates uh, than smaller or mom and pop landlords. One of the big corporate landlords, for example, evicts at something like two points, I forget what it was, I think it's like two to three times a uh, higher rate than mom and pop landlords. So these folks, these corporate landlords, are not necessarily too interested either in keeping our communities safe, keeping them stable, keeping our families out, off the streets, or they don't you know, really care much, I would say, for the interests of these smaller landlords that they say that they're actually adv uh, advocating for. And it's the reason why, whereas they have a lot of these big interests behind them, we have over 300 organizations in the state of California who are supporting us. Um, I guess I'm going to stop there. I've given a lot of information. I could have given much more, but I will be very happy to answer some questions during the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. And I have a couple of quick comments about League's position on Prop 10. Um, We have a we do have some concerns that if rent control is not done in the right way, it could backfire and, and cause some problems. And so it's not, you know, it would need to be done carefully, and it would not. And and I'm glad to see you're agreeing. And it would not always necessarily be effective. So it would have to be done carefully. The other thing that I wanted to highlight is that Renee mentioned uh, protection from eviction without cause, which is also one of the um, problems that this addresses. And, and finally, the League supports providing local communities with control over things like this so that if it is appropriate for their community and does well, um, and if it's appropriate for this, their community and it's done well, um, then they should have the opportunity to, to do it. Um, so I just wanted to, to point that out. I'm going to speak about two other bond issues which the League is not supporting. Um, proposition 3 is a water bond and Proposition 4 is a bond uh, on children's hospitals to support the children's hospitals. Um, and I want to tell you the reasons the League is opposing them. Proposition 3 is a water bond. If this looks familiar, it's because we had another water, water bond issue um, in the spring. This is a much larger bond. It's $9 billion. And it is nearly 40 pages long. I will not read it to you. But it has a whole lot of projects, some of them very worthy, and some of them not necessarily so worthy. And it's very specific about most of them. In case you're wondering, the only thing that I could find that might be beneficial to us was some money for the Coastal Conservancy which um, is active in giving grants here in our county. But there are several reasons why League is 
opposing this very large water bond. And as it says, we really need to manage and develop water resources in ways that benefit the environment and ways that um, benefit us. But this bond is not the way to accomplish that. It has a number of fatal flaws, including that usually the users of the water pay for it. Our county, our water districts or cities pay for the state project water, which we import. We pay for our local water supplies, um, whether it's groundwater or water from Lake Kachuma, you know, we pay for it and, and for treating it and everything else ourselves. This would push that sort of cost onto state taxpayers who, who would have to reimburse this almost nine billion dollar bond and the interest over 40 years would make it cost about twice as much by the end. It reduces the state money available for other critical programs and they mention here education and affordable housing and health care um, but it also takes some money, for instance, from um, the cap and trade system, which, um, which is used to help um, us fight climate change. Um, and it fails to provide for adequate project oversight, oversight and financial accountability and it's really one of these pay-to-play bills that has a lot of things that are, um, you know, it's, it's supported by a lot of the beneficiaries of uh, the particular, very specific projects that are listed in it. Some of them, as I said, are very worthy. We need some of them, but we need measures that will help us do it without the adverse consequences that this bill will, this bond measure will have. The Children's Hospital bond has some of the char same characteristics in that it's, you know, it, well-meaning, but it, again, was supported by the beneficiaries. There are eight children's hospitals in the state, private children's hospitals. A couple of them um, are connected with private universities. Um, but they get, these eight hospitals get almost three quarters of the money. The University of California system has five children's hospitals, and those would get 18% of the money. There are 150 other hospitals in the state that have children's hospitals or children's centers and who serve children with the same very serious problems, medical problems, that these larger children's hospitals do. All of those 150 would have to compete for 10% of the funds. One of those 150 hospitals is Cottage Hospital which you know now has something, a, a division that's called the Children's Hospital and the Children's Center. And so all of those hospitals, most of the hospitals in the state would have to compete
for 10% of the funds from this. And these eight hospitals have been using bond measures paid for by the taxpayers. They are nonprofit, but they're private. They've been using the taxpayers to fund their construction and improvement and equipment. This is the third one. And each of them paid one and a third million dollars to get this put on the ballot. So this is, is really not the best way for them to be getting their money. They, they are private nonprofits. The private nonprofit here, hospital here, as you know, gets a lot of money. They just made um, some major construction. They got their money the way most charities do by asking for donations. That's the kind of thing that these hospitals could do as well. And Lee believes that what we really need to spend state money on if we're going to is major improvements in healthcare all over the state and not just for a few hospitals. So that is, is propositions three and four. And now we will go ahead to Proposition 5, and that is property tax, and that is Uh, oh, the slides are here too. Wonderful. <laughs> that is cause. That is, yes, Frank Rodriguez, who is the community organizer in Santa Barbara for cause. And I want to welcome Frank. Thank you. Thank you. We good, Gary? All right. Good evening, everybody. How we doing? We good? I just want to make sure all the people that were maybe dozing off, they're awake right now. We good? <laughs> well, my name is Frank Rodriguez. I'm with the Central Coast Alliance United for a Sustainable Economy. How many people know about cause? Whoop, whoop. Um, and I, um, I'm glad that I'm going after Prop 10, right? Because Prop 10, we're talking about community organizing, putting um, um, the voice of people that are facing these evictions, facing homelessness, facing these, this housing crisis that is a real reality. Um, and putting something on the ballot. Um, so we're proud to be um, in unity with, with ACE and also with Housing Now, a group of um, a collaboration between labor, between community organizations, um, and community power, and really uplifting the voice of those people that are facing those um, evictions and those issues. And we actually just had five of our leaders that went in front of City Hall today to talk about the eviction, I mean, the, the decrease of 24% of our population and had one of our leaders on the phone who got evicted from Voluntario Apartments over um, Punta Gorda um, and Voluntario um, as they were calling us from Las Vegas um, as they're moving back over there because they couldn't deal with a rent increase from $1,650 to $2,200. Um, so going from that, let's look at it the other side. Why um, the league, ourselves, and many others are voting no on Proposition 5. Um, a lot of people know the history of Prop 13, and I'll get into that. But this is really the continuation of really trying to maneuver property taxes to benefit um, for the benefit of a few um, and hurting a lot of people. So basically what Prop 10 would do, it, it takes away over $1 billion each year from our schools and from our local services. Oops, the Prop 5. I should be clear on that. So no on Prop 5. Um, did I say Prop 10? Mm -hmm. can, we, can we 
put a rewind on the SBP TV. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so on Prop 5, the reason we're, we're saying no is this is not coming from the grassroots. This is not coming from, from the organizations like ourselves. But this is coming from the realtors, um, who at the time this was written was the only sponsor of Prop 5 and make more money every time these expensive new houses are bought and sold. Um, the other um, big organization um, that's supporting this is the California Apartment Association, who through our work here in the city, we've been in a lot of negotiations because they don't want to support a just cause ordinance, which is something we've been speaking on here today, um, in which we want to see protection from tenants from being homelessness, from experiencing homelessness, from being evicted. Um, so these organizations who have given each more than $3 million to this campaign um, for um, supporting Prop 5 are representing um, an interest that is so only supporting a few. Um, because what this is doing, it's, it would give people over 55 who can afford to buy bigger, more expensive houses to get a tax break. There are no limits to how many times a wealthy person can get a new tax break when they buy a bigger, more expensive home. And really the reason that a lot of organizations are not supporting this is because this is only benefiting a few and it's cutting valuable services, more than a billion dollars to our services in our schools, in our health services. Um, another list of um, from our fire department, which we know dealing with the Thomas fire this year, it's not a space where we want to see a limit on how much resources we have for our fire departments throughout the state, uh, for our police departments, health care, for foster care, for child and adult protective services. We're talking about these services that have already felt that crunch. For, after the, the recession, we saw thousands of teachers be fired and our class sizes increase throughout the state. What this would do um, is push us back. We already fought forward um, with Proposition 30 um, in 2012 and with Proposition 55 in 2016 that brought money, millions of dollars into um, these res resources, I mean these services in order to make sure that we don't have to be fighting back when we were in times like the recession. We want to make sure that we have an education program like we did back in the day that makes sure we have intelligent humans going through our school systems and making sure people can strive and survive here in our state. Um, so the main issue that we're kind of comparison between Prop 10 and Prop 5 is really look where the money's coming from. Look where the energy and the motivation and the um, people that are pushing these efforts. The only two, like I said, organizations that are supporting Prop 5 are the California Realtors Association and the California Apartment Association that are putting in over, uh, over $7 million together in order to see this su succeed. Um, so I really want to make sure that we really look at, the, at where the money's coming from when we look at these ballot measures um, and understand that we cannot take another hit to our services um, throughout the state and especially here in Santa Barbara. And I think I'm going to leave it at that um, and just really emphasize to, to make sure that when we look at um, why we're saying vote no on Prop 5, um, we're really focusing that the protection of seniors that this, um, that this ballot proposition is using. Um, I want to read one quote from um, the president of the Congress of California Seniors as he says, quote, how dare real estate interests use seniors and people with disabilities as pawns to sell more expensive homes. Seniors can already retire on their home equity without, mo quote, move, moving penalty. Prop 5 proponents made that up. Vote no on Prop 5. Um, and so I think there's a lot of misinformation that we're seeing, and we want to make sure that we're putting out the right information. So if there's any questions, please put them out there. But uh, please support a vote no on Prop 5. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. And again, if you do have questions, please write them down. And um, I hope, is Joni not here anymore? She is here. Good. She'll come around. Thank you. Um, our last speaker is Eve Sanford. She's a board member of COAST, which is the Coalition for Sustainable Transportation. And she actually has a degree in urban planning. And how did you get here tonight, Eve? <laughs> she rode her bicycle. I think Frank rode his. So, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Eve Sanford. Uh, I'm a Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm here to speak tonight about the No on Proposition 6 campaign, uh, which is kind of commonly known as the gas tax repeal. Um, I'm a proud board member of the Coalition for Sustainable Transportation and an urban planner that's um, had the pleasure of working with a lot of our local jurisdictions, including um, the city of Santa Barbara, city of Goleta, uh, Caltrans District 5, and uh, UCSB on some exciting projects. So. Uh, tonight, I'm here to talk about Proposition 6. Uh, basically, Proposition 6 would repeal um, Senate Bill 1, which was passed in 2017 as an increase to the state um, gas tax. Um, and also some adjustments to minor fees. Um, so the state gas tax increase that passed in 2017 took um, actually it was really the first increase to the gas tax or adjustment to it in 23 years. So it was sort of a, a somewhat painful but very long overdue sort of modernization of gas tax to sort of bring it into the 21st century and meet our modern day transportation needs. And it was really, uh, it took years of sort of labor between, it was a, a labor of love between all these different stakeholders, including um, state policymakers labor representatives, um, cities big and small, um, people in freight, and uh, biking and walking advocates, which is really where I got my introduction uh, to sort of the whole um, effort. Um, and so yeah, the, the group of people who, who really passed SB1 in 2017, modernizing the gas tax, um, it was a pretty diverse group of stakeholders that don't usually work together. I don't usually find myself like, you know, necessarily uh, on board with like uh, someone who's trying to, to widen freeways or, or you know, increase capacity a ton. Um, not that I don't see the need for it, but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like the group of stakeholders was pretty diverse and the group of people um, on the No on Prop 6 campaign has grown even broader. Um, so pro uh, Proposition 6 would repeal the gas tax. Currently what the gas tax increase has uh, done has increased the revenue um, state funding for uh, road and transportation work, um, $5 billion annually. So um, that sounds like a lot, and it, it is definitely making a huge difference at the state level and in cities all over California. But currently, our need to um, meet just like basic transportation needs in the state is actually somewhere more around $130, uh, 130 billion. So, um, over 10 years. So this, this sort of $5 billion annual revenue from SB1 that we're seeing is sort of just a dent, uh, is sort of just, you know, bringing us part way to the finish line of what we really need. And we're using this money already, and you see it going towards, I mean, largely towards road repaving and bringing roads just up to basic levels of maintenance. Um, and I could really go into, into a lot of detail about road repair, but it's just important to know that jurisdictions throughout the state of California, Santa Barbara included, have had a lot of trouble in recent years just keeping roads repaved at a basic level. And the challenge with that is that the more we fall behind on it, the more costly it becomes to repair roads. You end up having to completely go in and rip roads out and repair them, and it totally disrupts neighborhoods. So SB1 really complements Measure C, which passed uh, last November in the city of Santa Barbara, um, which was a major, was sort of the city saying, we're gonna meet the state and really repair roads in the city of Santa Barbara. It also uh, goes, a, SB1 uh, goes a long way to fixing bridges that are past their best by date. So bridges throughout the state of California are pretty much in a pretty big dis, uh, like state of disrepair. And uh, one of the supporters of the No on Prop 6 campaign is the American Society of Civil Engineers. And so they put out an annual report and um, pretty much like bridges in Santa Barbara, it's a pretty dismal state. Uh, SB, SB1, the gas tax is also modernizing public transit, doing lots of, uh, lots of good stuff locally here with MTD and with the new commuter rail line, which I hope everyone here has a chance to take. It's really awesome, but it's increased, it's added a new trip coming from Ventura 
all the way to Goleta, stopping in Carpentry and Santa Barbara, and then another trip back. And it actually, for a long time, there was been, there's been a challenge with taking Amtrak for commuters coming from Ventura to Santa Barbara because, you know, there just weren't, the timing just didn't work out. People ended up having weird gaps of time or just really not being able to use it for, as a commuter coming into Santa Barbara every day. And so, um, so SB1 is, is funding that commuter retiming um, on, the Amtrak, uh, on the Amtrak service um, from Ventura to Santa Barbara. Uh, it also doubled the state funding for biking and walking projects. Um, it's still just less than 1% of the state's budget, but it's a significant thing that is helping to build um, neighborhood greenways or bike boulevards on the east side and west side of Santa Barbara, and hopefully will one day create a north-south bike path um, throughout Goleta called the San Jose Creek Bicycle Path. Um, but yeah, so all of, this, all of these cool projects are coming from the, the $5 billion of annual revenue that SB1 is, is bringing into the state's transportation system. Um, another big project, I don't know how I could leave this out, but the, um, the 101 multimodal corridor, which is the widening of Highway 101 between um, roughly like Carpinteria um, to the outskirts of Santa Barbara. Um, that project has, uh, it's been a bit of a challenge over the years to secure enough funding for that, um, for that corridor to be completed. And so SB1 funding is really kind of what uh, finally gave SB CAG, our local um, RTP, the money to be able to complete that project, uh, which, is, which is a necessary infrastructure project in Santa Barbara. Um, in addition to just the highway widening, it also created um, some, several cool new projects in tandem with the highway widening, including finishing the California Coastal Trail, which is a bike path system between um, really it runs the entire extent of California, but finishing out gaps in that bike path between Goleta and Ventura, which is really exciting because it brings a lot of value to living in Santa Barbara, is great for residents, and it's also kind of regional and even maybe a statewide pool for tourism in our, um, in our area. Um, I would add that uh, w when we talk about street repaving, which is being funded by SB1 and the gas tax. I'm not just thinking about you know making the street surface smoother. It also includes much needed safety improvements, and so uh, that includes like ADA ramps and cuts. So that way, people with wheelchairs or in strollers can actually safely move around. And it also includes better, more visible crosswalks, better lighting where that's necessary. And um, and I would highlight that uh, the, the handout mentions and kind of alludes to um, how critical our road infrastructure and our transit infrastructure is for emergency preparedness. And I would just say that as we kind of look towards the future of California, it is essential that our transportation system is modern and is up to date and is in place in the case of emergencies. And so uh, most recently we saw that when Highway 101 was closed, um, thousands of people were separated from their jobs in Santa Barbara and their families. Um, and it was incredibly challenging for workers to be able to get to work. And not all workers have the flexibility of taking work off and, you know, or even like, you know, essential services like hospital, uh, like hospital employees really need to, to be at their workplaces. So um, in that entire case, we saw our rail line really kind of um, be tested to its limits with, um, with providing the sole transportation between Ventura and Santa Barbara. And we're really lucky that it was there. And, um, and yeah, so uh, I think for reasons such as that, um, one of the supporters, or sev I'll just run through several of the supporters for um, the No on Six campaign. It includes the California Highway Patrolmen, um, the California Professional Firefighters Association, like I mentioned, the association, um, uh, this American Society of Civil Engineers, um, several local transit operators, um, MTD released a statement of support for the No on Six campaign. Uh, the city of San Luis Obispo did. Uh, I could really go on and on, but it, it does bring together a pretty interesting array of stakeholders who all recognize that transportation is essential just for the well-being of a community. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time either, but I think I'm doing okay. Great, so I, I guess I should also mention that, uh, that a, 
a large part of why this is even on the ballot is a sort of get out the vote tactic by conservatives in California. Um, it it, it kind of came about in a pretty interesting way and I find it kind of challenging or frustrating because it does jeopardize something that's been worked, that so many people have collaborated and worked on and that's so critical, like transportation, it's incredibly critical. Um, but conservative voters in an Orange County district um, or leadership, I guess, in a, con a conservative Orange County district actually managed to kind of use the gas tax as, a, as their primary speaking point for recalling a state senator from, um, from an office there. And that's incredibly rare. I think in the history of California, only three state senators have ever been recalled. So um, it was really interesting. Uh, there's sort of a framing that set where they were able to kind of say, oh, well, he supported this gas tax and it's really caught, like, it's really kind of gonna make living here so much more expensive. And it's unfortunate and it, it could maybe be a lesson in why we shouldn't postpone updating something for 23 years um, because it does feel a little bit like maybe ripping the Band-Aid off. But the benefits of it are are far vaster than, like far more vast than just paying a little more at the pump. You know, we're really looking at funding infrastructure for the next generation of people who will be using our roads in California and taking trains. And, you know, hopefully one day I can take a, a train to LAX, you know, <laughs> from Union Station. Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, in the meanwhile, I'm still using the Airbus. But, uh, but yeah, so I don't, am I allowed to, um, that's not an endorsement, that's just personal preference. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, uh, in addition to that, the, the Yes on Proposition 6 campaign has been funded by a number of conservative candidates for the, um, uh, for the November election. And, you know, it, it does go to show that, you know, perhaps there is something that they see that they're getting out of it. Um, but I really don't want to focus on that because, uh, I don't know, I just don't. <laughs> I, I really do want to focus on, on the fact that locally in Santa Barbara, this has funded um, our transit system, awesome service at MTD that I really don't want to see cut. I want to make sure that MTD can serve the people who need it the most and people who just want it as an option. And I want to make sure that our streets are safer and that they're smooth, um, whether I'm in my Honda Fit or my awesome 1987 Centurion bicycle, uh, you know, like I just think it's essential, and, and not just for me, but really for the whole community that we um, that we vote no on Prop Six. Um, it's funding vital stuff in Santa Barbara, and if you want to talk more about specific projects, please approach me afterwards or any other questions. I'm happy to take them. Thanks. Thank you, Eve, and thanks to all of you. And I think we can start with some questions now. Um, and don't have too many. We'll ask these, and then if anybody has any that they just want to ask, um, if we have time, we can do that. We have some mics over there. Um, there's one question about Prop 5, which is kind of a confusing proposition, I think, as, as well as the person who asked this question. What does Prop 5 do, and how does it work? Frank described the adverse effects, but I don't know what it provides for. So. Hello. Oh, hey, it works. So yes, um, I'm just realizing in my talking points I didn't describe what is it exactly that Prop 5 is doing. Um, the way that it's going to be um, really decreasing the amount of funds that go into our services is continuing um, what Prop 13 did um, back um, when it passed in the 1970s, which re really froze property taxes to those levels and didn't allow them to increase. Um, um, I think there was a, it couldn't increase more than 2% per year. Um, um, and so those, num those levels we're still seeing today. 
So those levels that we saw for property tax um, scale that we saw in the 1970s, we still see today, and that's what really led to a lot of the decrease in fundings that we had for our public education. Um, so I don't know if people know are familiar, a lot of um, progressives have had, um, um, have contended with Proposition 13 and want to see it off the books because it doesn't allow our property taxes to really stay up to scale to deal with the population that we're dealing with and to deal with the children that are within um, our schools. I mean, really, for Prop 13 back in that time, um, a lot of the rhetoric that was being used um, and um, was that people was, were saying that their children were not the ones being affected because we saw a, a larger increase, um, especially of students of color um, that were coming in our schools. Um, so Prop 13 was kind of a, a, a pushback where property owners saying, I don't want to be contributing my piece of the pie in order to help out what is an ecosystem, which is supporting our public education, which includes our universities and our K through 12 systems. Um, so what Prop 5 would do was would allow somebody who had that property tax break from the 1970s to use it today when they would transfer from their home that they had bought back in the 1970s to a new home today. Um, so this is not addressing the housing crisis at all as a lot of the supporters are talking about because the people that are really the ones that are dealing with paycheck to paycheck, seniors that are um, the ones that are um, trying to, to really survive, aren't the ones that are selling these homes to buy bigger, more expensive homes. And so that's why, um, and I can read from what it says here, it's low income seniors and people with disabilities who live on fixed incomes are struggling to hold on to their housing and Prop 5 does nothing to help them. So this is really a proposition that's being pushed by um, the Realtor Association and the California Apartment Association to help out um, individuals that have the ability to buy bigger homes. Um, and so that's why a lot of people are against it um, because this has no solution to um, our, our housing crisis, to our affordable housing crisis. Um, and that's specifically what Prop 5 is doing. It's allowing people to continue to have those tax breaks when they're buying a new home. Thank you. All of the other questions basically have to do with props one and two. <laughs> so um, I think I'm going to start with the simplest ones first. Prop two, how much money is left from the 2004 Act? Do you know? So the way that the Prop 63, the Mental Health Service Act, works is it generates funding that goes to counties. And so there have been some articles recently about some counties that have put a lot of the Prop 63 Mental Health Service Act dollars um, in reserves. And so I can't, I don't off the top of, you know, top of my head know exactly the number, but there are huge millions of dollars of the Mental Health Service Act that are being unspent, that are um, being held in reserve by counties. And so that's part of what's pushing this. One thing I would add is, you know, Daryl Steinberg, who is one of the authors of the Mental Health Service Act, um, who's now a mayor of Sacramento, is supporting Prop 2 and feels that it is necessary to, to make this change to the Mental Health Service Act to, to free up some of those those dollars that are being, you know, basically unused and basically, you know, force the counties to use and direct those dollars towards the no place like home, affordable housing, supportive housing projects. Here's another question by someone else who asks, why are these funds not being used? Santa Barbara has a dearth of services for the mentally ill. So why hasn't the unspent, why haven't, hasn't the unspent monies been spent to alleviate those problems first? So, I mean, part of it is that counties will put large amounts of this money into reserve because, you know, when we think back to when we've had economic recession, the counties are hit very hard and 
you know, their general fund dollars from the county sometimes go down. And so, you know, they're keeping, trying to keep this money in case that happens. But, um, you know, that means that this money that the voters voted to be used for people with mental health needs isn't being spent. And, you know, my, my, my feeling is when the Mental Health Service Act first, those dollars first started to flow into counties, they're actually part of it was for um, supportive housing. We saw units at the Garden Streets that the Mental Wellness Center developed, paid for by Mental Health Service Act dollars. Some of the units at Pescadero Lofts and Isla Vista, which is supportive housing, were paid for with Mental Health Service Act dollars. The last few Mental Health Service Act dollars for affordable housing just has gone to the Depot Street in Santa Maria. The ground was just broken this week on that project. So um, it's been used very effectively in our community originally to build some supportive housing. So I would say, you know, supportive housing has always been a part of the Mental Health Service Act. So, I mean, that's one reason I support it. The other reason is, you know, mental health services themselves are very critical. And I agree with the person who wrote the question. And I think the league would also has a lot of policies around adequate funding for mental health services. There's a need for more, um, more funding for mental health services, but it's very hard for people to become healthy, to be well, um, if they don't have a safe place to be. You know, you, if you're experiencing homelessness, you're focused a lot of times on survival, and you can't focus on wellness and recovery. So this combination of the housing and the supportive services has just been shown to be the most effective approach into really helping people uh, move towards wellness. So I see, you know, the services and the housing are very interconnected when it comes to addressing homelessness. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. And following up on this, lots of questions about, about these, but it, it shows that people are really interested. What is the def definition of permanent supportive housing uh, and apparently that was in Prop 2 and in Prop 1 it was just supportive housing. So Prop, so. yeah, Prop 1 is the Veterans and Affordable Housing Bond, um, which is affordable housing and would, you know, help people with disabilities certainly, but Prop 2 is very specific to supportive, permanent supportive housing. And permanent supportive housing is a model that's been used you know, not only in our country beyond, but that really pairs the affordable housing. If it's permanent, that means with typically with a subsidy with supportive services on site. And so it can be at a project. You can see scattered site type models of permanent supportive housing also. But I can tell you that, you know, we've just recently surveyed in our county through our coordinated entry system, 1,020 people and we know that 433 of those people need permanent supportive housing. We know that from the surveying that we've done. We also know that only a few units of permanent supportive housing turn over in any given month. So there's a great need for permanent supportive housing in our community. That's something that we've seen other communities that have been able to pass, you know, local, local measures have been able to do. Um, but the state money would really go a long way in helping Santa Barbara County develop more permanent supportive housing. Thank you. And we have one more question here. Prop 3 is opposed for three reasons. It shifts costs to taxpayers, it reduces dollars for other needs, and project oversight and financial accountability. And the question is, how do Prop 1 and Prop 2 measure up to these criteria? Uh, I mean, I don't see how the shifting the end water end users to taxpayers, exactly, I don't see the, the relationship. Um, I, I don't see how those three bullet points to one and two. Um, maybe, yeah. maybe the person who asked the question, if they're still here, can come yeah. up and talk to you afterwards about that. And are there any other questions? 
Pardon me? Financial accountability. I mean, the, the league is supporting Props 1 and 2, and they do look for oversight in any of the propositions that they support. So they, you know, um, have supported both of these propositions. So um, they did not see any oversight issues with these two propositions. I think it's, it's, it's a good question, though, and, um, you know, I could look that up later, <laughs> um, but um, but I suspect, as, as Emily said, that that league did look for financial accountability in, in deciding about those two projects or two two bond measures. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask? I'm uh, one right there. If um, Measure G and Measure H didn't pass, I'm, I mean, I'm just saying one of them probably would. So what what is the process like right now? That it would remain what it is right now? Oh, if, if the I think the question is if they don't pass, what, what happens? Um, the process that, that exists right now is that the Board of Supervisors um, is the decision maker on redrawing the boundary lines. Uh, they, in the past, they've gone through a public review process where they've taken input, but um, that was a one-time program that they established. So it would remain just with the Board of Supervisors. Is, uh, is, is there a necessary, I've got a question, is there a necessary num, uh, amount of uh, votes that one of these needs to get? 50% uh, uh, um, is the passage rate for G or H, and if one gets more than the other, that's the one that, that goes into effect. So, but it, it is a simple majority. It's a simple majority. Anyone else? If not, thank you all for coming. <laughs>